Welcome to Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded Podcast. Hosted by Irving Rich. The Ephesian Epistle. By James Boyd. Ephesians Chapter 4. Not in every epistle, may I not say, not in any other part of God's holy word. Are the eternal counsels and purposes of love revealed before our adoring hearts in the same fullness as they are in this epistle to the assembly at Ephesus? In Romans we have the compassions of God let loose for the deliverance of the slaves of sin from its cruel bondage, in order that being made free they might be able to yield themselves to his delightful service. The first epistle to the Corinthians sets before us the order of the house of God on earth, regulating our conduct in connection with its sacred character. The second epistle is mainly occupied with the encouragements and consolations of God, and with the power of life in the risen Christ. With the effect of this upon the apostle himself in the tribulations which he endured in the service of the glad tidings. In Galatians we have the folly and loss eternal to those who would allow themselves to be enticed from Christ to the old covenant. And along with this the blessedness of the principle of faith, which involves sonship and eternal inheritance. In Colossians we have the hope laid up for the saints in heaven, along with the fullness that resides for them in their exalted head. As for Philippians, while it sets forth true Christian experience while on the way to heaven, it is an epistle that specially stimulates our spiritual energy to press on to reach the prize. The heavenly calling of God in Christ Jesus. It is full of the affections of the writer, and in their affection for him he most touchingly confides. He speaks with joy of their fellowship with the gospel, and he lets them know for their comfort that it was well known in the palace and other places, that he was in prison. Not because he was a pestilent fellow, or a breeder of sedition, but that he was there on account of his testimony for Christ. In Thessalonians he is occupied mainly with the rapture of the saints, and the day of the Lord. But not in any of these epistles does he unfold the eternal counsel of love. For this we have to get back to Ephesians. Chapter 4 is a continuance of what we have looked at in chapter 2, that is, at the close of that chapter where we have the calling wherewith we are called set before us. Of which we are to walk worthy. And in order to walk worthy the requisite state of soul is plainly set before us, and the moral characteristics are those that were gracefully manifested in the life of Jesus here upon earth, lowliness and meekness, long-suffering. Bearing with one another in love, using diligence by the exhibition of these moral qualities to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Three circles of this unity are set before us, there is one body, and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, and through all, and in you all. How contrary to all this the state of Christendom is. Instead of there being only one body, the bodies in that which professes the name of Christ are uncountable. The spirits also seem to be innumerable, and everyone seems to have a hope of his own. But the scripture here is not telling us what should be, but what is. There is one body, and that body is of Christ. It cannot be in any way altered. In whatever state the profession of Christ may be found this is ever true. It is just as true now, and as unalterable, as it shall be when we are all glorified. What then may we do? Manifest it in its true character, let it be manifested as one. This necessitates our putting on the beautiful characteristics of Christ. And this, alas, we have failed, and do fail, to do. Then we have that which is just as true as the fact that there is but one body and one spirit, that is, that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But as to this, the testimony is just as false. The Lordship of Christ, the faith, and the import of baptism are, as far as the testimony of Christendom is concerned, as false as is anything else. And as to the third unity the witness to it is also false and corrupt. God is above all omnipresent, and in all true believers. It may be admitted that he is above all, but that he is omnipresent and in believers is denied or ignored. But these moral qualities that were seen in Christ can only be adopted by each of us individually. Therefore we each may even in the present corrupt state of this profession maintain a true testimony to our absent Saviour and Lord. We have by grace his life and nature, and if we keep the flesh in the place of death, which is its proper place, those beautiful lineaments will be displayed. He has said, Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, Matthew chapter 11 verse 29. And surely his long suffering was severely put to the test. Though here on earth in lowly grace for the salvation of sinners, he had to endure their contradiction against himself. And oh, how patiently that contradiction was borne. When reviled he reviled not again, and when he suffered he threatened not, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. And as too, forbearing one another in love, bearing with one another may test us greatly, but love can do it. It is said of it that it bears all things, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 7. 
indeed, bearing with one another is in a sense not only a duty but a privilege, gladly taken up when we realize that we are children of the one family of God, and that we are members together of the one body of Christ. No closer or sweeter relationship could be formed. Peter says, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22. Let us see that love is the ruling principle with us all. Some may reply to this, saying, we must be careful to maintain righteousness. But you cannot have righteousness without love. Righteousness is an attribute. Love is nature. God is love. He is never said to be righteousness. In the place where divine love reigns, righteousness shall be maintained. Anyhow, in God's universe love does rule, for the supreme ruler is God, and he is love. Even natural affection, if not governed by the holy love of God, cannot be anything but corrupt. Even brotherly love among the children of God has to be safeguarded by the love that is incorruptible, the love that is of God. Where this love rules, righteousness, holiness, grace and peace will not be absent, and the unity of the Spirit shall be maintained in a practical way. But where love is not in activity it is all disintegration, and everything seems as though there were a host of spirits animating their respective systems or bodies. There is, however, but one spirit and one body in true Christianity. The body that of Christ, and the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, the one Spirit who forms the one body, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13. And this the one body of Christ universal. A member of that one body is every soul sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. And every soul is sealed who has believed the gospel. Today I see but little testimony to this anywhere. Everything seems to be in a fragmentary condition. Some take the ground of being gathered in the truth of that body, and that with myriads of saints in rejection by them. Whatever they may verbally declare, their practical ways proclaim the secret of their pride of heart, refusing all who cannot see eye to eye with them in their limitations and extravagances. They may mean well, but I have nothing to do with that, I have to do with people's actions. God only knows the heart. There is one body and one spirit, and also one hope of our calling. One bright prospect is before us all, and that is, to be with Christ where he is, and to be like him as he is. Where he is we shall be. What a glorious prospect. What a joy it will be to be with him, to be ever in the atmosphere of that love that surpasses knowledge. And oh, to think that every one of us in that vast company of ransomed and glorified saints shall be able to say with hearts overflowing with gratitude and thanksgiving, he loved me, and gave himself for me. How marvelously captivating is all this to our renewed minds and hearts. But to find those who are members of one body, and that the body of Christ, at variance with one another, and speaking evil of one another. What an evidence of the allowance of some foreign element belonging to the flesh, that disturbs and upsets our whole nervous system, and paralyzes all our spiritual energy. And to find those who are indwelt by one spirit maintaining divergent views on questions not at all vital, and pressing them in such a way as to rend the saints practically asunder and put them into little cliques and parties, each little company with a brazen wall around itself, in order to prevent fellowship with saints of God from surrounding gatherings not with them, is a certain evidence that the voice of the Spirit has unhappily fallen upon deaf ears, and that their own vain notions are preferred to the word of God. Yet such is the state of the profession of Christ in this present day. How grieving it is to the Holy Spirit, and dishonoring to the Lord. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Here a wider circle comes up before our vision, not all in vital relationship with Christ. Not every one that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23. And the next circle is still wider. The Father is only in believers, but he is over all in the universe and everywhere present. But to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. All the grace we require for the service given to us in this wonderful sphere of blessing comes from our exalted head, and is bestowed upon us directly by him. All fullness resides in him. Nothing needful for the carrying out of that which is the purpose of his love resides in us. He gives according to his knowledge of the one to whom he gives the gift, and according to the position given to him with relation to the service in which all his servants are engaged. And all comes from him who is on the right hand of God. He had followers when he was here upon earth, and they had their special work assigned to them. In Mark 3 we read of him calling twelve to be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. In Luke chapter 10 we find him sending forth seventy. But none of these are necessarily the individuals we have in view here. He is said here to give apostles, but this is the action of the risen and glorified Christ. 
possibly most of the twelve, were the same, if not all. But whether they were the same, or whether they were different, the gifts bestowed upon them, and the service given to them were different. Those sent out by him when he was here on earth and in presentation to Israel were to announce the kingdom of heaven as at hand. But now their service is in connection with those who are to be members of the body of Christ. Wherefore he says, when he ascended up on high he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now to say that he ascended involves the fact that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. For the point of his departure is not here from heaven but from earth. When he came down from heaven he came only to earth. He came here to reveal the Father, and bring the love of God to men, but when man would have none of him he went down further, even into the lower parts of the earth. He said in the day of his rejection, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, Matthew chapter 12 verse 40. Truly he might have said in the words of Jonah, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars was about me forever, Jonah chapter 2 verse 6. But he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens. He went down to the very bottom of creation. It was necessary that he should bear the complete judgment that rested on man, though this is not just the thought here, he went down into the stronghold of Satan, and there broke the power of the enemy. He went down as the victim, and has ascended as the victor. He led captivity captive. The devil has no prison now. There is a prison for him, in which he shall be bound and shut up for a thousand years. But Christ has set his captives free, and is gone up far above all heavens, that he may fill all things. The first Adam has filled this world, but the last Adam shall fill the vast universe. Every trace of the first and failing head shall pass away forever. The first has filled this sphere with lust and pride, the last shall fill everything with the love of God. Everything from the heart of the earth to the heights of all heavens shall be filled with Christ. Everything shall be filled with the glory of redemption, and the glory of redemption is the love of God. And now this ascended and glorified man has given some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, with a view to the work of the ministry. With a view to the edifying of the body of Christ, until we all arrive at the unity of the faith and of the Son of God, at the full-grown man. At the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Christ. To fill the universe with the fullness that is in Christ a body seems to have been necessary. If we think of our own bodies, and how necessary they are to us, we may be able to form some true thought of the importance of the body of Christ to himself. It is in the body that the man gives expression to himself. The mind gives expression to itself through the body, and all its activities are shown forth in the various members. Here, however, it is needful that the imagination be kept under control, for we are dealing with the great and holy thoughts of God. But that Christ shall be displayed in his assembly is unmistakably written on the page of Holy Scripture. Even now does he thus manifest himself, coming to light in his members. The assembly is said to be the epistle of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 3. When he appears he shall be glorified in his saints, and admired in all them that believe, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10. We are partakers of his life and nature, and as luminaries it is our privilege to shine in his light in this dark world. His desire as expressed to the Father in his prayer, John chapter 17, is that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The nourishment of the body is by the gifts given from the exalted and glorified Christ, and by the fullness that resides in him, and this shall be continued until we all come to the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. According to the effectual working in the measure of every part, makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. What a marvellous organism this is! Unnoticed by the men of this world. Made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Here it is not so much a matter of ministry, as of growth, the body as it were feeding itself, itself building up in love. The nature of God, for God is love. When this glorious truth has worked its way into our souls by the power of the Spirit, we may be able to say with the Apostle, What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. That I may win Christ. The same Apostle when writing to the Colossians says as to Christ, whom we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. 
when we have thus got Christ before our souls we shall not be children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the sight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Of this devilish activity on the part of those who are enemies of the gospel, there is a superabundance today, and that almost, if not wholly, confined to the Christian profession. But of this we are well warned in God's word. Nothing should take us by surprise. We are told about everything that the devil can bring in to overthrow the faith of the saints of God. And then we know he never wearies in his efforts. The evils have been coming in from the very beginning. Paul speaks of all the Asiatics as having departed from him, and simply because he was for the name of Christ in disgrace with the rulers of this world. In the second chapter of the second epistle to Timothy the servant is warned against profane and vain babblers. They were there in his day. In chapter 3, the profession of Christ is in a miserable state of corruption. Instead of their souls following hard after Christ, they are running breathless after pleasure. In chapter 4 they prefer fables to the word of truth. Today all these evils swarm through Christendom like a colony of wasps. They are everywhere and fill of devilish activity and venom against Christ. And many who are not deeply infected by their virus are weak and enfeebled by the poisonous atmosphere of their surroundings. From the tents of such corrupt men let us make hasty retreat, lest we fall under the deadly influence. And let us seek to get the babes in Christ out of their infantile condition. As regards those not skilled in the word of righteousness, they are in great danger. Their thoughts are altogether occupied with the adjustment of their relations with God from the standpoint of the sinner, not from the standpoint of divine counsel, and the ways taken by God for fulfillment of those counsels. Hence all their concern is for the salvation of the soul. Their own selves and their security are the things around which all their thoughts revolve. But when all this has been perfectly and divinely settled, and the soul is in the enjoyment of the love that was manifested toward us when we were yet sinners, the thoughts of God use with not only in the sense of compassion, but for the fulfillment of his own eternal counsel, purpose and grace, given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Those thoughts of God usher us into a world of bliss entirely different from anything we have ever seen or heard of with respect to this world, whether in innocence or guilt. And his thoughts, not our own desires for our own happiness, but for his own glory and our eternal delight, become the subject of all our meditations, hopes and expectations. And each one of us with a full heart cry out in his holy ear, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great the sum of them! If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand, Psalm chapter 139 verse 17. Milk is not now the only nourishment that suits us. We can take with thankfulness the strong meat belonging to them that are of full age, Hebrews chapter 5 verses 13 to 14, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The wind of doctrine that issues from the infernal regions which at one time we may have been ready to hail as balmy breezes from the paradise of God. We shall not now be likely to be mistaken as to its origin. How infinitely delightful it is to dwell upon the fact that God is love, and that from the fullness of the Godhead that dwells in Christ we are being nourished and built up in the true knowledge of himself. From this fullness that dwells in our exalted and glorified head we draw our inexhaustible supplies, and thus the body increases with the increase of God. Colossians chapter 2 verse 19. And knowing this we are not surprised when we see the anxiety of the servants of the Lord, as recorded in the New Testament, that the saints should increase and abound in love to each other. For dwelling in love we dwell in God, and God in us. Therefore these Gentile believers are exhorted not to walk as the other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. This is the truth as regards man, whoever and wherever he may be. The light of Christianity may exercise a restraining influence upon him, so that only in secret does he appear in his true character, but all that is attributed to the Gentiles is true of the whole Christless world. Whatever may be professed. Man is said to be alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in the whole fallen world, because of the blindness of their heart. Natural man is in as deep darkness as anyone blind can be. He has no knowledge of God at all. If he is a religious man he may pride himself in not being an infidel but his heart is as dark as the heart of the greatest infidels could be. The life of God, where he may see it in the children of God, is to him utterly obnoxious. He is in opposition to it wherever it appears in his presence. He may do his best to hide his abhorrence of it, but the enmity is there, though covered up. In this epistle, life is viewed as in God only. 
he quickened us when we were dead in our sins, and it is in that life that we are made to live to him. The true characteristics of this life were exhibited in Jesus, and only perfectly in him. And as Christ is our teacher, the truth as it is in Jesus into which we have been instructed, involves for us our having put off the old man, corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And being renewed in the spirit of our mind, and our having put on the new man, which according to God is created in truthful righteousness and holiness, a creation which is according to God. This is the new man which we have put on, having rejected and cast off the old man, which is corrupt, that we may be able to receive unhindered the teaching of Christ, who turns our attention to the life of Jesus here upon earth. Therefore truth is to characterize us. Lying is natural to us all. Men are said to go astray from the womb, speaking lies, Psalm chapter 58 verse 3. And even saints are ready to forget when they prevaricate that they are only following the devil, who abode not in the truth, and who became the originator of falsehood, John chapter 8 verse 44. And as we are members one of another, what place is there for lying amongst us? Not that we should lie to anyone, but when we are all members of one body, how horrible it is to bring in deception, and thus be guilty of bringing corruption into the body of Christ. And if we are to be angry we require to be on our guard, lest we harbor vengeful feelings, allowing the flesh to come into the trouble, and room to be given to the devil. Thy brother then becoming vile in thy sight, Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 3, and hatred usurp the place in thy heart where love should reign. Thus would everything be left in the hands of the devil. Therefore let not the sun go down upon our wrath, lest we also give place to the devil, who will not be slow to take advantage of our folly. The thief is to steal no more, rather to labor with his hands, not only for his personal necessities, but to relieve the necessities of others. Thus, where an ugly defect of a fallen race was evidenced, a beautiful character of Christ is exhibited. Instead of the mouth giving forth corrupt communication, its outflow is to be good and edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearer. The law speaks of that which issues out of the mouth of the unregenerate sinner, and we shudder at its faithful testimony, their throat is an open sepulchre, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Now the law speaks to the man under it, in order that his mouth may be stopped. A gateway open for such a welter of wickedness as this had better be shut up for ever. But if the heart is purified by faith, and grace is poured into the lips, the outflow shall be a delight to the heart of the hearer and refreshing to the weary among God's pilgrims on their way to glory. All those lovely graces are sure to manifest themselves where the Spirit of God in ungrieved. He is the power by which the beautiful graces of Christ are in us reproduced. He is the power of the life which we have in the Son, and if he is unhindered that life is certain to be expressed in our ways as we pass through this world. By his Holy Spirit we are sealed until the day of the redemption of the possession purchased by the blood of Christ, and which is ours in him. When he takes it by power, we shall come into possession along with him. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking, are to be put away from us, along with all malice, and kindness, tender-heartedness, forgiveness of one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us, are to take their place. We are viewed in this epistle, as we have seen, quickened by the life that is in God, and therefore the beautiful features, as they have been set before us in Christ and which are the characteristics of that life, are to be exhibited in us. We are never asked to practice any spiritual grace that has not first of all been exhibited by God in the life of Jesus down here. If we are partakers of the divine nature, let us endeavor to exhibit the lineaments of that life and nature while here in this scene of contrariety.